This is Tony Wright again. This is FLCC and AB Wright Ministries. And we are in our 90-day Bible study. We're on day number 37. We're in the book of Job, uh, 8th chapter, 1st verse, and we'll be going through the 24th chapter. Now, you know, when we stopped yesterday, Job's friends, they had come by for a visit, remember? And after they had sat silently for like seven days, when the silence was broken, uh, they were trying to help Job come to terms with why he was being afflicted. And one by one, uh, they were taking their time trying to convince him of their convictions. And then one by one, Job was pushing back. Now, at the same time, though, Job, he was calling out to God for why. And as we start today's reading, his friend Bildad began to talk. And Bildad was upset because Job was still claiming to be innocent. And Job had nerve to question the justice of God. Bildad, he was making the point that it was not possible for God to be unjust. God, just not a God that would punish a just man. So, as they used to say in the math and physics courses, therefore, yeah, mm -hmm, therefore, Job must be unjust. He just needs to stop playing and come clean. Now, God already knew, and so did Bildad, according to what Bildad was saying. There were just no exceptions to the principle that a just God, punishment, then it's applied to an unjust person, period, full stop. So both he and Eliphaz were making the argument that suffering comes as a result of an individual sin. Bill that he even attributed Job's children's death to their wickedness. <laughs> Hello, friend. Boy, <laughs> this dude is cold blood. But, but Bill Dad had assured Job that in spite of his wrongs, if he sought after God while he still had time, God would hear him, God would bless him. But Bill Dad told Job that he just has to put his trust in the right thing. If Job has to, you know, put his hope in anything other than God, it's going to all be for naught. And he argued that God would not cast away this perfect person, but God will not help evil do it. So Job's response was pretty simple. He, he said he already knew that the wicked would perish ultimately. But he still doesn't understand then why is he suffering? Because he still didn't feel that he'd done anything wrong or anything that should bring this kind of suffering. And he needs to be able to present his position to God. But there's just no such thing as arguing with God. And that wouldn't even be productive. So Job felt that although he's not perfect and that he strives to be you know, faithful and good, but he argues that even though he's tried to live a good life, for whatever reason, God has chosen him to single out and for whatever reason, condemn him. And although Job was a little short and uh, impatient in his reaching out to God, he refused to curse God. And he refused to reject God. Job said that no human is innocent in the eyes of God and that we're not even capable of winning a case against God. God is the one that put the sky in place. He hung the star. And that of all the miracles, the many miracles of God, there's not one single miracle that we can truly understand. So he said that God constantly walks past us and we don't even hear or see God. But God is there. So Job says that even though he's done nothing wrong, that the only thing that he can do against a God, you know, so, all, so powerful is just plead for mercy. And even if he's innocent, if he speaks his own, his own words, only going to serve to prove him wrong. So Job said that now his life is just speeding by and there's no hope of happiness. And every day goes by quicker than a sailing ship. So Job said that sometimes he tries to be cheerful and not complain, but he just can't take this suffering. And he knows that God still considers him to be guilty. So what's the use of trying to prove his, his innocence? He feels like God had just done him wrong. And how can he put God on trial? Who, who could judge that case? He said, if, if someone could take away that rod, though, that God has that has him in fear, then he would speak up without being afraid. <laughs> this boy, Job, he going through it. You hear me? He said that he's just sick and tired of life. And that from this place of despair that he's in, he would just go ahead and complain to God. If God would destroy someone that he created, he said that God molded him out of a piece of clay. 
So now is he just going to turn him into dust? He said, God hasn't even explained all, all these things to him yet. So how is he being held accountable and being punished for all this stuff? <laughs> Job is just, he's out there. He said he's continually being judged no matter how hard he tries. God keeps hunting him down and punishing him. Job said, why did you even let me be born? Why couldn't I have even just, why couldn't I have just died before I was even born? And I, I, I don't even have long to live. So why can't you just leave me alone? Now, by this time, Zophar had heard about enough. So he said, dude, so much foolish talk just can't go unanswered. You use your words to silence other people and you made other people ashamed. So now it's time for you to feel a little shame. You claim to be so innocent and you think what you believe is acceptable to God, but God would tell you that wisdom has a whole lot of sides. And God has punished you, and even though he has punished you, it's less than what you deserve to be punished. You, you don't know the things of God because there's so much higher than your thinking. So far, I argue that God knows the heart of vain men and he finds out their wickedness. And he tells Job that if he's reaching out for God, you better make sure that he's not holding on to any iniquity. And that uh, to make sure he's not harboring any wickedness at heart. But, and if it's pure, then he can face God without fear. And he can be secure in the fact that, you know, there's going to be hope for him. But if he's still holding back any wickedness, that there's going to be no escape for him. But again, Job just fries back with his answer. He said, yeah, mm -hmm, sure, but you're just human and you don't hold all the wisdom. <laughs> My understanding is just as valid as your understanding. Do you think that I'm somehow inferior to you? Uh, who do you think doesn't already know this stuff that you're talking? <laughs> but I'm the one that's getting mocked by my neighbors and, and, and I'm, I'm just an upright man and still I get scorned and I get laughed at Job he was not taking any mess off his friends you hear me so Job went back to direct his address directly to God now he said that he wanted to make it clear though to his friends that whatever he has to say to God that it's meant for them to hear too so Job rebuked him again told him be silent just listen carefully as I present my case or the case that I would argue before God. So Job, he stressed that uh, he's going to speak as he views the truth, regardless of the outcome. And that his determination is set. And when he, he's failed his challenge and his challenge is over, he predicts he's going to be left with no option but just go ahead and die in silence. So Job is going to enter into this contention with God, even if it costs him his life. Job he expresses then one of the more famous lines that we know of, of him that says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now, the Hebrew word that's used here, yeah, is translated as a verb that usually means wait or hope. But in a lot of places, it's meant to be endurance or uh, perseverance. And here it's usually translated as some form of perseverance. So what he's saying is even though God may slay me, Yet will I persevere in faith. Now, can we say that? You know, can we really say when we're going through stuff? Do we really persevere in our faith? Do we really persevere in our faith toward God? Or do we just do the classic thing and kind of throw up our hands and walk away? Boy, <laughs> Whew. But anyway, not Job. He said he'll wait and he'll hope. As King James Version puts it, he would trust in God. Now, this gives us a pretty good understanding of what Job's commitment is. And that we as believers, we find that commitment and that faith to be very beneficial in our lives. Is it? You know, you know, for us, this picture of faith provides that certainty that most clearly expresses what it means for us to have that proverbial patience of Job. Remember early on, Job being rebuked his wife for even suggesting that he respond to his condition by cursing God. His last words from that ash heap was, they posed the question, Shall we receive the good at the hands of God and not bad? And now we see Job really answering his own question. Because no matter what he receives from the hand of God, whether it's good or bad, Job will cling to the hope that God will ultimately justify the righteous sufferer. Now, Job has cursed and he's lamented, but to no avail. And his friends have urged him to be patient and to trust in God's eventual justice. But Job, 
He, he's despairing because he says he doesn't have the strength to wait on God that long. So he's just resolved to uh, take God to court. <laughs> but he doesn't expect justice because he said he knows that God will not answer his charges. Now, Job dares to take another risky step toward confrontation with God. And against all odds, he said he will argue his case face to face with the creator of the world. And his salvation would not come from winning the case against God because there's no hope of that. But his salvation is going to come from knowing that he's been true to his convictions. That a sinner, a one that's perverted by wickedness, godliness wouldn't even dare to try to stand before God. But Job, he seems prepared and determined to do so. So Job finishes his call for judgment. And it, with this final series of demands, he said, let the wicked be exalted for a little while and then be no more. And let them be brought low and shrivel like grass and let them be cut off like the heads of grain. Now, as Job presents his view of the kind of judgment that's needed, he then issues a bold challenge. That anyone to prove that his discernment, that Job's view of things is wrong. He asked, who has the moral authority to argue that, that I've lied about what I've seen? Surely not, my friend. Job's conclusion is that they've already shown themselves to be willing to cover up the truth about the way the world works. You know, who, who can show that there is nothing worth taking to heart about what I have said? So Job knows that. God can decide that his own words are useless. And from his experience thus far, it, it pretty much validates that his cries for justice have changed nothing in heaven. They ain't changed nothing in earth. Is that how it is? Isn't that how it usually goes or what? Man, after all the pity party, all the anger and all the arguing and frustration, nothing. Do you hear me? I mean, nothing gets changed in heaven. Nothing gets changed in earth. Boy, somebody needs to help me. Now, Job refuses to believe, though, that God does not care about the chaos of the world. He said if that was true, he would have to conclude that God is not a, a God of justice after all. But, you know, Job's committed to that conviction that God is just. And since, not if, but since God is just, since that's true, Job knows that he will eventually be vindicated because he's convinced that God knows his heart. Now, Job is going to hold out. Boy, he doesn't know when, but he knows that God is surely truthful and righteous and just. And although right now, he does, it kind of seems like that justice might be hidden away somewhere in deep, dark corners of God's heart, but Job is going to keep on reaching and searching for it. Boy, hey, you need to keep on too. You keep on reading this word, and you keep checking us out on your favorite social media platform. And like Job, Kept telling his friends, you, please, tell your friends, tell your neighbors that FLCC on the move. And we're taking ministry back to his first love. Peace.